Welcome to the webinar on benefits of Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt training. This is a re-recording of the original webinar due to some visual problems with the graphics on the original one. This webinar should last just about an hour. There will be no questions during it, but we will get emails to the questions that were during the original webinar sent to everyone who views this. Just request it. This will talk about the history of Lean Six Sigma, some of the Greenbelt roles of organizations, how we train, what some of the materials you would get from this course that we would offer at Smarter Solutions, plus some ongoing learning activities. <clears throat> Motorola invented Six Sigma, our guests came up with it in the 80s, when they were facing quality problems as they just started mass producing digital pagers at the time. Problem was there were so many pagers they couldn't inspect them. As I recall, they were, they were finding that nearly every returned one had been reworked in the factory, and they passed it as good and it had to be had it had actually not been good. <clears throat> so what they did is they came up with a method to measure quality through sampling using continuous data, and they were able to predict quality even though they hadn't inspected a bad part. So it was the first move away from total quality management where it was inspecting quality in the parts. Quirk got good. There was a number of companies were involved early on, Texas Instruments and IBM. I was actually at Texas Instruments in the 80s and was one of their early black belts trained there through Motorola. It came in the 90s, General Electric adopted Six Sigma, so that's the one we hear about more. Jack Welch came in and said, we're going to change our company, we're going to drive quality. It was really a burning bridge type deployment where everybody got on board and they moved on. It was at General Electric they adopted the really the martial arts thing. Before that, there was black belts. That was it. By the time General Electric came about, consultants wanted to train a lot more people, so they had green belts and they had yellow belts, master black belts, and it became a whole series of classes. That's really what we see as Six Sigma today. Many companies have adopted it throughout the U.S., if not throughout the world. One thing it did provide us was the DMAIC model, or Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. This is not much different, I would say, from the the scientific method or any other improvement methods you may have been taught, <clears throat> with the exception of maybe the control phase. I think that was a bit new to process improvement time where you made the improvement, now you step back and made it permanent with a control system, generally control charts, pro production management systems, plus a good documentation and savings. I think that was a little bit new to the process improvement world. About the same time, but it was really a couple years later after Six Sigma started, a number of people went to Japan and saw the Toyota production system said we should bring that to the United States. So they wrote a book, The Machine That Changed the World and the Lean Enterprise, and a handful of books. And that gave us what we call Lean today. Lean is really the Americanization of the Toyota production system. It focuses on the same principles, but does bring some Americanism into it and less some of the Japanese culture out of it. It focuses on doing everything just when you need it, the right number of parts, the right quality, and just at the right time. But the goal of lean, and what lean really means, is the reducing of waste or fat. So that's really what it was about. <clears throat> they brought some stuff value-added, non-value-added. For those of us that are older, knows these were terms we used for time value studies and workforce studies. It wasn't really a new concept. But what lean brought to it is that the goal of a process is to only produce value with the least amount of waste and effort. So you define it, but you really went on a waste hunt for a lot of lean projects. And the seven standard wastes are shown here, overproduction, transportation, over inventory, waiting too long, too much motion, which is really human motion, defects, and then over process, in other words, doing more than you needed. You might find in some more modern books there's other ones, an eight and a nine, Sometimes say people is another waste, and there's some more about environmental or the social waste involved in some programs and projects. Next piece we want to talk about is the theory of constraints. It also came out in the, about the same time, but this was really the early 90s. Elijah Golrat came up with this system, and it really took process improvement from the process level up to the business level. And it started with a paradigm that your whole business is really a system that is a function of processes. You can't look at them by themselves and actually improve them properly. You need to look at the whole system, identify the constraint, what is holding your back, could be the weakest link, and that's where you would apply your improvements. <clears throat> Many of us at the time realized the benefit to Lean Six Sigma. I guess it was Six Sigma at the time. And used this as a method to target where you should be doing your improvements. 
very well received. Probably everybody in manufacturing in the early 90s had a copy of this book, and it's still very popular. You may want to look at it. It's called The Goal. If you want to get it, it's not expensive. It's a paperback. It's a very good book to read. But here's a little diagram of sort of what they were trying to teach us. Assume that those jagged lines are the diameters of a pipe, and the two parallel lines where it says customer and demand are what you're trying to get through the pipe. So you're pushing production through this pipe, and the gap is how much capacity you have. You see at step five, its capacity is less than the customer demands. If you think of it as a water pipe, what happens? Pressure builds up on the backside, like work in progress, extra work, and then it comes out really fast out the end. <clears throat> but you don't produce as much as you need. So in theory, constraints would say any improvement in any other step but step five will not increase your customer output. It may make you more efficient, save a little money, but at the same time, you're not selling anymore because the customer output to meet the customer demand is just not being met. So we like to believe that Lean and Six Sigma introduces some of these concepts to get a complete system for you to be trained in. Now, how they all sort of fit together, <clears> Toyota <throat> to, to production system became Lean. Six Sigma became Lean or Six Sigma. There was an American Society of Quality effort to show you how I could start blending them about 15 years ago where it said, do a little define and decide, is it now a Lean or a Six Sigma project? Probably the last 10, 12 years, they've had truly integrated Lean and Six Sigma, which is what Smarter Solutions teaches, and what all the top providers give you. And then we're going to get down to what we call the Integrated Enterprise Excellence Lean Six Sigma, which is our version, which really integrates the theory constraints, a lot more business view into it. We try to focus more on Lean Six Sigma being a, a good tool in a business rather than the goal of the business. So really we see it as a support organization or a support effort to drive business goodness. It's just not a process improvement effort. Look at it this way, it's a lot more effective in your business. So knowing that, whoever you get training with, it could come from any of those methods. But what's a typical Lean Six Sigma green belt training? For many years, black belts were the ones that consultant trained, and green belts were trained internally, generally by black belts. Now, if you think about it, they're only teaching what they know. It generally wasn't great training. It was usually focused on tools and methods that those black belts in the company found were useful, and they would leave stuff out that they hadn't personally used, whether it was beneficial or not. The general rule was two weeks of classes led by an instructor, generally 8 to 20 people. There was lots of coaching, many mentoring in the classes. Many of the businesses would assign a black belt to help each green belt. But most green belts were really part-time improvement people. They would stay in their work group. They would improve their work right around them with the people they deal with. But generally, these people did not move out into other groups and continue improvement. They focused all their time in their work area, which gave them some benefits. They didn't really have to go learn soft skills because everybody trusted them. They were good. But one of the weak points of this model is there really was no central authority what green belts did or even how to certify them. It was just every company did their own thing. The American Society of Quality has made an effort to now start putting down a black belt and a green belt and a master black belt body of knowledge. But I, I think the good companies are still using that for a guide, but not everybody follows it today. So there was a lot of variability in green belt training. It became so popular probably in the last seven, eight years that I guess since there's no certified authority, anybody could teach it. Companies popped up and started teaching green belt training everywhere. They might just have a black belt, or they could have even picked up a book. It's some of the books we train with in Forrest Breifogel Road are really good books. If you wanted to spend the time, you could create a whole course out of them. But we see one here in Austin that's a human resources firm that just decided to start selling Lean Six Sigma green belt. Now, we compete with them on contracts. They've been doing it a year. We've been doing it 20 two years, I guess. If we look at a website, how can you tell? It just says we teach green belt. I think that's one of the weaknesses in all the Lean Six Sigma stuff. Because it doesn't there's nobody that says you're good at it. You can make a website and start teaching it. And if you look across it today, and if you are a good looker for green belt training, you're seeing week long classes, two week classes. <clears throat> some that have a project, some that don't have a project. Some only require an exam. There's some online ones that you just take the online courses no one looks over you, and when you're done, they give you a certification. That's one of the troubles we see is that really there's no standards. You can, they all get, they all look the same. 
you don't know what you're getting as a buyer, it is very difficult. We recommend you interview, talk to whoever you're doing with, get references. Generally, finding someone who's been through the course, <clears throat> don't believe that they like it unless you also see they're successful. Because really, most of these training firms do it just to make money. They have no investment in you or your skills. So it, it's really become a commodity out there. It's got a label. It's like buying ketchup, I guess. It could be any brand. It's just ketchup. Not to me, I like Heinz. But either way, it's sort of embarrassing for the, the truly good consulting firms, the 10 or 12 of them that are out there, that are really going to give you something good. But that's something we struggle with here. Generally, what you see is a set of slides that somebody wrote. They're very general. The instructor fills in all the content. When I was teaching it two other companies back, <clears throat> the instructor just picked the textbook that he wished to teach out of, he or she. The notes never matched it. If they said, well, here's a t-test, we'd look in the book and say, here's more to read about it. But there was a book, because you should have one, and then there was class notes, and that's really all they had. The good ones still use good statistical programs. We use Minitab for ours, but there's JMP. There's a couple of good choices, but some of the lower end stuff, they're just using an Excel add-in or they wrote some simple software. It's almost like Greenbelt trains turn into a continuing education program that if you can make it to the end of the class, you get a certificate. It's lost a lot of its rigor. And I talk here about rule four of the funnel. It's a Dr. Deming, one of his training things, and here's a little picture of it, because I guess I can't help being a trainer all the time I do this. But the idea of the exercise is it's a process control. When you have a funnel, you drop a marble, and you plot where it stops rolling. And there's rule one is you just keep dropping the funnels. You aim your process where you want. You get a minimum amount of variation around it. There's rule two and rule three about how you adjust the target based on where the marble ended. But rule four is you drop the marble. In this case, it's off to the right. You say, well, we're going to define that as best practice. Now, that will be our new specification. So we move the funnel over and aim it at the last dot, drop a new marble. Well, now that one's still somewhere else. And you say, well, that's our new target. So you keep defining best state or the current state by what you have as is today. You see a lot of companies do it. They just keep resetting their process to what we have today, and pretty soon you forget about the whole body of knowledge. We see a lot of that with green belts when there are probably only three or four original sets of training material. Everything else is derived from the class that the instructor took. Some of these are four to five revisions. They're not very good. So that's about training. But what do green belts really do? A, a good program creates green belts that can be improvement project leaders. And in some level, they're also data analysts, because you learn about handling data in one of these classes. Smarter Solutions, like all good providers, teaches you to be one or both. But generally, you're an improvement leader in your own segment of the business, as we talked about earlier. This is the first question that we had in the webinar. Improve your project. What, what role do you think you would be asked if you were a green belt in your own company? It turned out in the real webinar, the one that didn't come up much was cause and corrective action. People thought they'd be improvement leaders, data analysis, and change agents were about equal in this, but not too much about cause and corrective action leaders. And I'll say on this question got put in there as I did it, um, the corrective action leader was really a benefit. You learn so much in these courses you become a great leader of little actions, too. So it is a really general education. It allows you to do many things. What are the differences in green belts in different companies? Now, I struggle when someone says, what's a green belt? I almost have to ask where you are, who trains you, what it says. I've worked at places they were full-time improvement leaders. Sometimes somebody else identified the problem and set them after it. Most cases, though, they're part-time improvement leaders, stay in their business unit. They don't go to a different process improvement organization. They just work where they work, use the tools in their own department, maybe go after emergencies or special cases in other places. But there's also another case that a number of companies use Greenbelt as a training for the managers or coaches within the organization that are dealing with data analysis or process control. It turns out that this is a great training just to be a manager. It teaches you how to see change, make decisions, and how to drive improvement. There are other assignments. Many green belts use it as a stepping stone to get the leadership positions, because if when you lead a team and you can solve problems, you're also probably a good leader of work the workforce. Some use them as change agents. They actually use it to change their job inside of their company, 
Sometimes they move to change to jobs outside of their company. It's odd the lead in Six Sigma skills in, this, in some business areas around the U.S. where jobs are tight. Having a green belt or black belt skill allows this person to actually change industries and still be a valued worker. But there are also a few green belts, and one of them that I work with, it's now Master Black Belt at Smart Solutions, took his green belt class within the first week, went up to the Master Black Belt who was teaching, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a Master Black Belt someday. And he said he was laughed at. But some people find that this whole concept of looking at data and making improvements fits their life view. And I guess I was one of those. Once I saw this stuff, I said, this is really cool. And I actually went out and got a statistics degree afterwards because I like this stuff so much. But there are some people that just love to fix stuff and figure things out. But that's the other roles you might see as a green belt. Now, if you look at this, darn, doesn't that sound good? All I got to do is take a class and I can do this? Well, it's really not that easy. <clears throat> not everyone would be successful enough to move beyond their current job. Because, you know, everything you try, you're not the best at. But it also depends on the quality and breadth of your instruction and support and what, how good the class is. If you get a lousy class, you probably won't do much. Generally, if most students to be successful need a lot of support and training. Because one of the real ways you get lead and Six Sigma knowledge is when you start connecting the tools to what business does. I guess in my experience, I found the only student who's probably not ready for green or black belt, which we both consider beginning courses, is someone who's right out of school or brand new to a workforce. They don't have the life experience yet to tie these to seeing stuff. I just, in my guess, I guess with no facts, is two to three years in the workforce, whether it's uh, even in a different job, You've now seen how business runs. You've experienced processes. That's about the minimum requirement probably to jump into one of these classes. We have had fresh college students that take it, that get, oh boy, but they really struggle. I don't know if they actually learn all they could. Uh, they probably do well if they're in one of the very good classes that's got an instructor that can really work with them. But just being a year or two into a business and seeing things really makes these, these tools work well. I guess I want to pause to talk about my story for a minute, why I get to give this webinar. I became a black belt with Texas Instruments in 91, as I said. Started as a chemical engineer. I had a chemist degree at the time. Worked up to be the site engineering manager over the 10 years. Within that, they brought in Six Sigma, and I became a black belt. And I got a master's in statistics at the University of Texas here in Austin. Well, I loved that job more than being a manager. And some the business thought I would they wanted me a manager, so I chose to move so I could be a statistician. So I moved up to Pittsburgh and became a research statistician for the Department of Energy. Big change from being a manufacturing engineer. When I was there a year or two, they found out that I was a black belt and they had Joe Bechtel started managing the, the site. So they told me I was going to master black belt training to be a teacher. And I found out I really liked that too. Uh, I was a worldwide trainer for Bechtel. We taught class after class in Las Vegas. It was great fun. Uh, but I became the go-to guy for the company to teach the analyze phases and also became an analyst. The Lean Six Sigma stuff opened doors as a business analyst for all over the company. I actually got to work on the big dig to go through an analysis of their safety issues in Boston after they had a tunnel wall failure. But I did a lot of that for the whole company. It was really fun. I got to doing that, loved the teaching so much, I ended up moving back to Austin to Smarter Solutions here and became a lead instructor and consultant. And I've really enjoyed that too. It's opened my horizons for a lot of stuff. But again, I was just going to be an engineer. And when I started Lean Six Sigma, it drove my career in many different places to get me here. Who knows what's next? So let's talk about if you took a Smarter Solutions Greenbelt class, because some of this is a marketing effort. Here's what we would prepare you with to get through the class. You'd understand your improvement skills that define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. You'd learn a lot of advanced data analysis tools that you can use outside of projects. Testing, looking for differences, uh, understanding variability, which is probably a big one. There's also soft skills training. We touch on leadership, team, lead, team management, how to give presentations. There's a lot of the skills about how to communicate what you can talk about in numbers to get people to believe you. And probably the big one there is the ability to understand and prove areas where you're not an expert. You get to the point to realize that the data really does talk to you. You don't have to be a subject matter expert to make improvement. Now, 
buried under this, we do use statistics, but it's oddly not a statistics class. People who hated statistics in school still enjoy this by the nature. We really focus on the tool, how it's used, and how to interpret the answer. There's not as much studying equations and stuff, and that's why we use Minitab software. It allows you to do as good a work as a statistician with only knowing how to use a package of software. Another advantage of a good course, of which we have, of course, or I wouldn't be doing this, is having a textbook that actually matches the training material. It allows you to refer students to the textbook when it maybe get confused, they need another view of it, but also when they leave class, they have a reference to go back to, because so many people go back to your printed slides. <clears throat> We've got a little project execution workbook with project maps. It explains every step. There's examples of output. It's almost like the real handbook that you use when you actually running a project. We also, because we are all big process believers, we've got a huge roadmap with checklists that you can use for toll gates or actually to see the big picture. Because some people have trouble starting on that D and the M and the Demaic without knowing where they're going. I think the chart we, we can give you a copy by PDF, it's 96 inches long and 36 inches high, fills a whole wall. But that's what the step that black belts, green belts, and master black belts all go through when they solve a project. Advantage of doing this is we teach the green belts out of the black belt reference material, just different slides. So on a coaching session, if you wanted to do something as a green belt that wasn't in the class, one of our coaches can say, open the textbook to this page, look at the, the project execution book, and we can walk you through it, and you will have known enough to quickly teach yourself how to do advanced tools. This led us to the next question in our webinar, again, since this isn't live. Which of these is most important to you? So you were to check the boxes that mattered. What's interesting to me is the textbook matching the course lessons was the lowest of all. It came out around 7%. The experiential exercises matching your business with exercises and lots of discussions were the winners. Learning at my own pace was not as high, and I think part of it because we're talking about a classroom session. People that put a lot of benefit in learning at your own pace generally move to the e-learning or the self-paced training classes, and of which we, we also offer. But we're really now talking about the classroom sessions. So again, even though we believe textbooks are a real integral part of having a great course, it was not rated as high by the, the people that attended the first webinar. So this is a copy of the book, so I'm still going back because I think the books are important. We give you a series of books. The, the Green Belts get these three books, the Volume 3, which is about doing an improvement project. It's got the whole Black Belt body of knowledge in it. Then there's some other business books that you can just read. They talk about the business aspects of Lean and Six Sigma. We give you the roadmap guide. Here's a little diagram of that roadmap. I know it's unseeable. If you look at those things, those are actually the text in that is readable. I think it's a font 12 when you print it out. So it really talks about every step and every decision you make in doing an improvement. We also give you, of course, printed copies of all the slides in a binder. The binder's got to be three to four inches thick in some cases for every week. But the nice thing about it, the binders and all the slides are referenced back to the textbook and to the workbook. So if you need more work and you're not sitting with your instructor, you can actually go reteach yourself it. We also use Minitab, as we said earlier, because that means we don't have to teach as much statistics. It allows a real simple way that you, most of the students use that software well beyond running improvement projects. They find it's got a great way to look at all kinds of data. Now, the work, probably the worst side of all of it, there is homework on many nights that you take home, you work, or take home or to your room, work it out, come back, we work through in the morning. It's part of trying to judge how training is done. One of the questions came up in the webinar was, how do you judge how well your training is going? Smart Solution uses the Kirkpatrick method of looking at it. They have a series of levels of training assessments. The first one we do every week is how do you feel about it, how was it, the, the soft questions. We also do the next step is can you actually apply the things, which we do through um, in-class exercises. We do it through some out-of-class homeworks to make sure you can apply them in a classroom setting. The next tier up is can you actually generalize them when you walk out of class when you don't have help. That's why we have a project requirement for certification. You have to exercise a project. The fourth level, which we don't assess in our world, is can you generalize, apply these things outside of the genre. We, don't, we give up with running a project, so we walk through three levels of assessment for your skill level. Now, 
what's about teaching? I have found that very smart people are not always teachers or good teachers. You should expect your classes to be taught by an experienced Lean Six Sigma practitioner. Generally, it's a master black belt at most consulting firms. or And I've seen a few very senior black belts that are okay, but that's not always a good teacher. So a good teacher should be able to answer the question four or five different ways, two or three layers deep, and they should also be able to apply context to anything in the course to you so you understand it. Now, we talk about it. That's when we talk about teaching the key things here. You just don't teach one way and expect people to get it. Even our e-learning course, we work real hard on the touching multiple teaching methods. You should watch it done to understand the theory. Then you should do it as a group in class. Then do it individually in class. It'd be great to have an experiential exercise. Most or Lean Six Sigma courses use catapults or other exercises to actually generate real data and experience what's happening and use it. Then you use it out of class. That's the homework. And then you generalize it during class discussions and run a project. In our class, it, we do believe that Lean and Six Sigma is more of a business course than it is a math course. So it really means you need a lot of human interaction. We have provide every student with sign up at no extra charge, three hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching with a master black belt. And I see an error in the slide that we didn't even change from the real or the first one. MGB type of car. I meant to be master black belt outside of the classroom time. This doesn't count time in the class. This is when you can ask questions. You can check over analysis. Some people actually use it for topics outside of their project. But you get three hours of a top person working with you. This also covers the cost of certifying your project and all the reviews that go along with it. There it also includes extra instruction if you need a topic that wasn't in the body knowledge for the class. But it's really you can use it however you want. Some people think that might be the bigger benefit of the class. I could have learned it from a book, but that three hours of time with a smart person to help me made it real. This led to our last polling question in the webinar. Choose the preference for the level of connection between the green board, the course, and the reference materials. Of course, again, we're going back to the question of the training to the books and the slides. From I, I really don't care if they're related to have some references up to the bottom where we've really integrated everything together. It turned out nobody put none. They say some value in integrating the slides, the reference books, and the exercises all together. But as you, if you looked at it, it was a skewed distribution. Routine reference to books was the peak. There was a smaller number thought it should be integrated, and then it tailed off through a few references. Uh, but that's the way the, the group thought that it's still integrating the reference material to the course and the instructor and all that. It's nice, but it wasn't everything. My guess would most people after our classes rate this would scale would be more towards the integration because it's hard until you're in the middle of it to realize that you need to go find a different way to learn it sometime. And that integration is real powerful in class. Now, there's other people that do it, but we think we do a very good job of it here. Now, let's say you can't do classroom training. I've been talking about the online session. We've tried, I think, at Smarter Solutions. We've got other webinars out there about online training. But there's been four tries with the company until we finally found one that met our quality requirements. I was involved in two of them. But the latest one was a combination with moresteam.com to use their learning management system, their simulations, and some very good tool material to build around it the whole body of knowledge and this learning system and the roadmap. So what we have created now is a green belt and a black belt online training course that we call Blended that, that involves a high level of individualized coaching and touch through email and conference calls. You never have to actually travel. We have kept able to keep exactly the same certification requirements, the body of knowledge, the coaching, and even many of the same homework questions in both that and the classroom option. So we're finding equal performance of the students coming out of it, if not slightly better in the online ones. But then our testing seems to be that there are people that like to go back and review material live, but and you can do that online. It just takes more time. In the classroom, it's very difficult to take the class back through a topic again. But no, there's an option if you just can't travel to a classroom, if you can't even we're finding now in the recession, a lot of people can't be gone for a week. So it's the only offer that they can get through. We also offer Black Belt and Master Black Belt courses, as all good providers should. Again, Black Belt's online in the classroom. If I didn't say it before, we see that as an entry-level class, though. 
it's not you don't take green belt before black belt in our model although there's some providers that do well with that we've chose to teach all of them as a complete demaic course straight through black belts are generally more people that are going to take a role temporarily or permanently as a process improvement resource that they're going to float around the company where they're needed master black belt training is really black belts that have had a year or two been very successful and realize it fits their life and they either want to be a teacher, they want to be a program manager for improvement, uh, or they want to learn really big subjects and big projects. That's really the end of the training that anybody gets, but you become a generalist so you can walk around and do just about anything. All good Lean Six Sigma folks realize that it isn't a one and done course. There, I, I've been doing this 20 years, and I'm still learning stuff every time I do. I pick up resources. I learn from my students. There are things if you choose this path, even if it's not with smarter solutions, you need to find a way to keep learning because there's always more. You'll get better connections through your experience. Uh, most companies would offer something. What we would offer here, even if you have not been our student, we've got blogs available on the site to talk about both the business and the practitioner side of business process improvement. We've also got a resource library that all you shared with us is an email address, but since you're on this webinar, we haven't already, that there's articles and old webinars that we've been doing for six years that you can read or watch. They're wonderful to just learn a little bit more without spending a lot of time. And we still have an ongoing series of webinars, white papers, uh, topics. Uh, the CEO speaks all around the country. There's lots of stuff you can do, but if you really want to keep on your edge, you need to keep some type of continuing education. We'll give you the opportunities even here if you don't pay us any money. Well, that ends up being about the end of the webinar. So I went through all the history of the Greenbelt roles and training and some idea of the ongoing learning opportunities. A couple of the questions that came up with, which is always we hear, is do you have special training for people in my industry? And I think the one that came up was the financial industry. <clears throat> Smarter Solutions has been through this, and one thing we don't do is we don't teach flavors of Lean and Six Sigma. And you'll see them out there. And I'm, it's not right or wrong, I think. It's, it's our policy. Is it, There's ones you can see, this is Manufacturing Six Sigma, and this is Service Six Sigma, and this one is for the financial industry, and there's a lot in healthcare these days. What they do is they focus on examples that are related to that genre, and they generally drop things out that they cannot relate to that genre in class. And I've always struggled with that, because if you're in a hospital or a bank, there's still the manufacturer analogy for transactions that are going through fast, uh, mass production, repetitive processes. But there's also, even in manufacturing, you've got procurement, you've got HR, you've got business processes that are identical to one in a bank. Why would you only want to learn a piece of it? So what I still believe the best course is a general one that relates all the topics to each genre and teaches you that it's not about time on task or turnaround time. It's about, this is time data for a continuous process, what can it tell me? And when you can generalize away from the context, you find your way more powerful. And so I, you'll find that we don't offer specialized Lean and Six Sigma courses, because we've really learned the body of knowledge doesn't change if you're in healthcare service. Even in more steam, when they give different flavors of their online course, they want the manufacturing piece it only adjusts maybe a third to a half of the examples to that context because there's some that are important to learn outside of a manufacturing context. So it's a really not, I would say it's not so good to take a genre specific course, take a general one. I think you'll be better off. Well, I'm going to end it here with that. If there are questions, and since you might be watching this late and you didn't get a chance to give one because you were not with the class, feel free to email them in. You uh, if you can be info at smartersolutions.com or you can text me or email me at rick, R-I-C-K dot H, Haynes, my last name, at smartersolutions.com, or just call in or sign up from our website and we can answer it there. But luckily we do well enough here we get to spend time doing stuff and helping people that call in, not just our clients. So I hope you got something out of the survey, got something out of the webinar, got something out of one of the topics anyway. It was worth the time for you. This is really a neat subject, and if you're trying on it, whether you choose Smarter Solutions or not, it is really a good thing to learn.
and I think almost everybody gets their career advanced through it. Thank you very much.